It only takes a second to understand why archaeologists missed something here. From the ground, it's trees. From the air, it's more trees. But then LiDAR gave this place a new map, and that map revealed a path to a tomb that was hidden for centuries. All across this forest, archaeologists are shooting lasers through the canopy to reveal ancient cities. The LiDAR on my iPhone uses an infrared laser, so we can't see it. Is there a little civilization down there? Here at Howtown, we report on the methods of science. We read the papers, we talk to the researchers. It was just a game changer, really. And today, how LiDAR is rewriting the textbooks about the ancient Maya. This is probably the world's number one hotspot for hidden cities. It's the border area between Mexico, Guatemala, and Belize. And it's part of Mesoamerica, a region where several ancient civilizations thrived. The biggest cities nowadays are in the highlands or close to the coast, but the ancient Maya were different. Some 3,000 years ago, they started settling across this whole region and built deep into the middle of the tropical forest. It's almost easier to imagine that this is a galaxy far, far away than that people actually built cities in a jungle this dense. But that right there, that's Tikal. It's one of the largest and best studied cities of the Maya lowlands. And just for reference, that's an area that's about the size of the UK. If you're wondering what it's like in that part of the world. Oh, it's amazing. I mean, I, it is the greatest gift I've had in my life, except for my family. There are massive trees, mahogany trees, trees, lots of roots on the ground. The full gradient texture of the forest. Birds in the morning, it's like a concert. You hear howler monkeys at night. And they sound like uh, lions. People that come there for the first time, they get a little nervous about it. It's just howler monkeys. It's almost like if we had left New York without humans for about 500 years. Construction at Tikal spanned 1,300 years. And then this stone slab, dated AD 869, was the last dedication on the site. By around the 10th century, Tikal and many other Maya cities were famously left behind. What happened there between the 10th century and the 20th is kind of hard to believe. Within a few decades, vines and trees sprouted from the plazas, the pyramids lost their red pigment, mud covered the foundations of homes, and nobody came back to restart those cities or to build something new in their place. It's, it's great for us archaeologists because unlike many other civilizations in which ancient cities were covered by modern cities today, like in Mexico City, for example, but here in the Maya Lowlands, we have thousands of square kilometers of uh, for only forest covering the, the Maya settlement. I went to Peru last year, and in the middle of Lima, there's an old pyramid but it was basically built on top of by like successive civilizations. That's kind of the core paradox of Maya archaeology is that uh, this forest is obscuring their view of everything that's not really big, but at the same time the forest mm -hmm. is the exact reason why the sort of city plan is uh, intact and sort of legible. Preserved. Yeah, and LiDAR is the technology that resolves that paradox, but in the 1850s, when the Guatemalan government kind of rediscovered Tikal, everything but the tops of the temples would have been covered in mud and plants. So these photos are from when? These photos are from the late 1800s. Well, these are pretty good for late 1800s. Mm -hmm. Very detailed. These images were taken on glass plates by Alfred Maudsley, who traveled to Central America to escape the English winter in 1881 and ended up writing an encyclopedia about the region. Maudsley wrote that Tikal was so completely covered over with forest that even after he hired men to clear trees around the biggest pyramids, he could only see enough to draw this sketch. At this point, a lot more was known about the Aztecs than about the older, larger Maya civilization. And it wasn't clear if monumental sites like Tikal were isolated religious venues or places where people really lived. The answer would take another 75 years. It's the mid-1950s, the Guatemalan government had built an airstrip, established the national park, and set up an agreement that allowed researchers from the University of Pennsylvania to work at Tikal with teams of locals for the next 13 years. Penn could explore and restore the site, but every artifact they found would belong to Guatemala. 
But the part of their research that I really wanted to see, I was able to track down at the library here in New York. It's their map. They painstakingly plotted 16 square kilometers around Tikal, showing 2,000 structures, reservoirs for water storage, the contours of the terrain. And their map left no doubt that Tikal was a city where tens of thousands of people lived. From there, the researchers branched out in these defined strips, and they kept finding more ruins. For the first time, we understood that the Maya actually didn't just live in a city center. Tim would use those same techniques in his own work decades later. We were doing these very small tag lines using survey tape where we would walk 10 meters side by side using compasses. Sometimes we would have to walk two hours out to our field site and then two hours back. And then by the time that airborne LIDAR came into the picture, was Tikal pretty much mapped? Was everything kind oh, of- Oh gosh, no, that's a great, that's- No. No, I mean, about 20% was mapped. I actually went to Tikal in 2006, but oh, wow. I only have two photos from there. Uh-huh, a staircase, nice. What happened after that is that I dropped my digital camera off of that pyramid oh. and it broke and it didn't work for the rest of my trip. Wow. Fortunately, there's a lot of great stuff on Storyblocks, which is our sponsor for today's video. Of course. So they've got time lapses, there's some slider shots, close ups, details of the pyramids. And just out of curiosity, I checked another stock site. And for like a single clip like this, they would be charging literally $500. But on Storyblocks, you get, of course, unlimited, unlimited downloads, downloads for one set fee. So to get started with unlimited stock media downloads at one set price, you can go to our URL, which is storyblocks.com slash Howtown, or click the link in the description. So I have on my phone a mini version of the tool that would completely change how archaeologists map sites like Tikal, but you need a special camera in order to see it do its thing. So this is portrait mode on my phone using LiDAR to try to figure out what in the image to blur. And here I've set up a forest made out of my house plants to scan it with an app called Polycam and see if we can find the hidden message that I left in there. LiDAR works by measuring the time it takes for laser pulses to return to a sensor. It was invented in the 1960s, but the big breakthrough for archaeology comes when you put those lasers onto airplanes. Your profile picture on ResearchGate is this, is this cool shot of you with sunglasses on, you're in the <laughs> cockpit of a plane. Are you actually in the plane during these flights? That was the coolest part of, of, of my job. Now they, nowadays I do more, more stuff on, on, on the computer. On the, in, Juan is a yeah. geospatial engineer whose relationship to archaeology is kind of like an x-ray tech. You know, are the ones that take the x-ray and kind of help. Sometimes the doctor makes sense of, of what is it that they're seeing. But his lasers don't actually see through anything. Here's how it works. You get an airplane. Like a six to eight seater. Fly at 600 meters above the ground. We call it like low and slow. It's usually very hot and bumpy. Makes you sick. <laughs> like the first 10 minutes are exciting. The next four hours are boring. You go back and forth across the target area like a lawnmower. And within that strip, the, the laser is kind of doing like a kind of a zigzag pattern. When, if I was to look at the laser while it was doing this, would it be like do 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 do? Or would it be like... Mm. <laughs> well, no, the scanner oscillates about uh, 25 times per second. Okay. And the whole time, it's sending pulses of lasers faster than we can imagine from three different angles. 450,000 measurements per second. Those lasers expand by the time they hit the trees. 20 to 30 centimeters in diameter, so something like this. And the billions of photons in each pulse instantly reflect off the planet in all directions. Two or three percent of, of the signal that it's emitted comes back to the sensor. How long is that journey? 1,200 meters divided by the speed of light. And like, you know, it's, it's, it's very, very small fractions of a second. Now the key to all of this is that even though the Maya forest looks as dense as a head of broccoli, some of the photons slip through the cracks in the treetops, past the branches and vines, and bounce off the ground. If you have hiked around, you sometimes see like, you know, the, um, the sun will come through certain gaps in the canopy. So basically what we're doing with LiDAR is that we use an, an artificial sun and we move, move it all over the, the, the jungle canopy, right? Trying to see like where are those gaps and how we can hit the ground. If they send 15 pulses for each square meter of ground, they're hoping that at least one of them will make it all the way down. Sometimes none of them do. At most, maybe three or four. 
So if you have the flight time for the laser returns, you have the GPS position and orientation of the plane, and you know the speed of light, the reward for all that effort is a point cloud. Each point here is a laser return plotted by latitude, longitude, and elevation. And they have an algorithm that makes good guesses about which of these points are plants in green and which are the ground in brown so that they can digitally delete the forest. Another set of algorithms can fill in the space between the dots in a variety of ways that make it easier to spot the telltale signs of human design. And that's when the archaeologists start to, you know, go crazy and like, you know, try to make sense of what they're seeing, right? And how do you know if it's hit the ground versus like a, a low-lying bush? I mean, I, there's just, there's so much going on on the, on the floor, the forest floor. They have from one pulse, maybe several returns on their sensor. And they are looking for the lowest one. Mm -hmm. Their algorithm can classify those as ground. Is that always going to be mm -hmm. true? No. It seems like the next step is to like go to the place and be like, oh, then you you know dig a hole and see was is there a wall underneath this mound of of dirt or exactly. that sort of thing. Yeah, so they've been doing that in sort of sample areas in some of these sites, and the general conclusion is that the lidar map misses more than it invents. So mm -hmm. you have sort of more false negatives than false positives, but you do have a bit of both. The first big test of LIDAR in the Maya region came in 2009 at Caracol. It multiplied the mapped area there by eight and showed a vast landscape of agricultural terraces. News spread quickly that the forest had been defeated. I, you know, I was shaking my head. It's like, how, you know, how did we not have this before? <laughs> Francisco would get his own LIDAR data to work with seven years later, when a foundation called Pacunam launched a massive LIDAR survey across big chunks of Guatemala including 150 square kilometers around Tikal. We open these images on a big screen and we just, you know, you know <laughs> in five minutes, we discover more sites than uh, in my entire career. The data showed 60,000 structures, leading the researchers to extrapolate that the Maya population may have reached more than 7 million across this region. Even at Tikal, one of the most studied Maya sites, the estimated area of settlement quadrupled after the survey. Each black dot here is a structure, like the buried foundation of a residential plaza, and the red square shows the scope of the 1961 map from the library. The LiDAR data convinced archaeologists to take a closer look at this bump near the city center. Turns out, it's a unique pyramid in the style of another civilization a thousand kilometers away. Shallow canals also appeared in the nearby wetlands, and those are almost impossible to spot from the ground. And the researchers could even start to map out where the elites lived based on dimensions of mounds that could have held vaulted stone houses. They weren't all clustered at the city center. Instead, elites were distributed among the commoners in networks that suggest they wielded some local control. What it really allows us to do is in a non-destructive way, start to document much more systematically the ancient Maya, but not just the big temples and pyramids. It really has opened the door to us understanding, you know, how every Maya community kind of adapted to their special place on the landscape. Further north. Um, At a site jungle. northeast of Tikal, Francisco followed a LIDAR map to a small pyramid. He could tell from the map that looters had been there maybe decades ago, but there was more to be found. Well, we kept digging. And further into the pyramid, we found an earlier uh, tomb with an earlier king. Jade pieces formed a small mosaic mask. These spiny oyster shells would have been rare and precious, and there was more. I remember picking up these uh, femur bones and shipping them to the lab, not noticing that they were carved with the image of a king holding uh, a mask like, like the one that we have found in the tomb. And it turns out that there were glyphs that identify the god um, of the mask, as well as the king. So many clues inside one tomb at one site in a huge forest filled with hidden patterns that suddenly we can see. It's cool, right? Well, it's always cool when, you know, nature reclaims, 
human civilization. Like <laughs> there was this where I grew up, there was an old World War II military base, and I used to go there to collect snakes. And it was so cool because it was completely overgrown with with all kinds of bushes and trees. But every once in a while, like there was this one place that used to be a movie theater, so it had like this weird sort of amphitheater dug into the ground. In a place like this that's, you know, centuries old, the amount that nature has taken over is is just on another level and to be able to peel mm -hmm. that back and see the contours of a city that once you know was just as active and complicated as any town that we would know today i mean it just opens up so many possibilities and also like yeah if if nature retakes a place like new york city in, in thousands of years and future archaeologists are kind of poking around here you know, what they would learn from excavating Midtown Manhattan and studying the Empire State Building mm -hmm. is really different from what they would learn if they found some evidence of the subway system or the you right. know, residential blocks in Queens. And the scale of the Maya modification of the landscape is just so much more complex than they knew before. When you talk to people in the field, are they like, okay, we've pretty much scanned most of the places we're interested in? Or is it like, oh, we're just scratching the mm -hmm. surface? More of the latter. There's a map here that goes up to 2019. Oh, wow. So it's just these little lines and little blocks that they've, they've done so far. And the lines are typically surveys that were not done for the purpose of archaeology. These are mm. mostly environmental surveys of the forest that archaeologists have been able to repurpose because they were done by NASA or some other organization that made those data publicly available. This map is out of date, but I don't have a new one to show you. All I know is that they've scanned a lot more of the Maya lowlands than you see there. And we can expect to hear about newly discovered cities and new insights about the old ones in papers that are coming soon. But yeah, I can't talk about that. <laughs> okay. I can tell you that it just blew our mind once again. <laughs> so eventually you guys are just going to map the whole region. The idea, uh, you know, before I die, is to map the entire Yucatan Peninsula, especially the parts that are, you know, under forest. All right, John, we're going to dig into my LiDAR data, but first, our work is supported by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation in association with the Independent Media Initiative. The Sloan Foundation is enhancing public understanding of science and technology in the modern era, and it's also supported by Patreon members like you. And one of the coolest things about Howtown setting up a Patreon community is that a lot of you have special technical skills that I don't have. So in this case, you uh, helped me process the LiDAR data from Polycam, and I'm curious how that went. So as we get, and we can rotate. Nice. What does it take to sort of remove everything except for the purple dots? Yeah, so pick a Z threshold Z value and throw everything above that away. Yep, there it is. That's my secret message. <laughs> well, thanks so much. You're welcome. <laughs>